Welcome everybody to another episode of Lockdown 23 and 1. That's right, today I got another grip of stories coming your way. All lockup and crime related, of course. So if you're new to the channel and enjoy this type of content, hit that like, subscribe, notification bell before you leave. And check out my playlist with many more videos for you to start watching today. Now the first story, I remember hearing about this individual. It made nationwide news for the most part. But the title of this article is Natalie Holloway's killer, Jordan Vandersloot, jumped by two inmates in a Peru prison beatdown. Oh man, these titles, they get juicier every day. But it says Jorn Vandersloot, the Dutch national who brutally killed Alabama 18-year-old Natalie Holloway during her class trip to Aruba as a high school senior in 2005, has been pummeled in a remote Peruvian prison. That's a mouthful of words right there, pummeled in a Peruvian prison. You could put that on a t-shirt and make millies. The 36-year-old murderer is locked up in Peru for the 2010 death of Stephanie Flores, the daughter of a Peruvian business magnate, whom he killed in her father's casino five years to the day after Holloway's murder. Look, I got four daughters, and if I owned a casino and found out that one of my daughters was killed in it, man, you know, that, that would definitely shell shock me. It goes on to say that the motive of the attack is unclear, but two inmates jumped him in a prison common area before guards stepped in. Medics reportedly treated him for his cuts and bruises and sent him right back to general population. Peru ain't got none of those side pockets, man. You mess up, they just put you in the deeper, darker part of GP. You know, but uh, for it being a prison in Peru, at least they stopped the attack. You wouldn't think any of that be going down. If he was in Alabama, Louisiana, Mississippi, any of those type of prisons, man, he would have been as good as gone. Nobody would have been there to stop nothing. A national prison spokesperson said that many people want him dead. Now, a former inmate who did time with Vander Sloot said that the killer that stands at six foot five is an arrogant douchebag. <laughs> oh man, I ran into a few of those rich smug cats in prison. I got a couple stories actually. I'll probably do that later on down the road. The inmate that did time with him continues saying he walks around the jail like he's a boss, demands what he wants, treats others like shit. He made a lot of enemies because he's such an ass. Vander Sloot is serving time in Peru's mountaintop Chalapalca prison. Hopefully I pronounce that one right. Vander Sloot finally admitted in October to killing Holloway with a center block in an Aruba beach as part of the extortion and fraud case in which he tried to shake down the victim's mother for 250 G's. This guy definitely should have gotten a death penalty somewhere in one of these countries or states. It says in the international plea deal, he's serving his sentence on the U.S. charges for extorting Holloway's mother in Peru. This is a picture of Mr. Vandersloot at the mountaintop Peru prison. It says it gets below freezing every single night. And that coat definitely backs up what they're saying in the article. Looks like he just got done building an igloo. But this picture is of him being extradited to Alabama for the extortion charges on Holloway's mother. And wouldn't it be something if he survives all this time in a Peru prison, but as soon as he steps foot in the Bama jank, gets got instantly, right? That really put uh, into perspective how violent U.S. prisons can be. But at the same time, he's just going to court, so he's probably only going to be over there in Alabama for a few months at most, if I were to guess. And also, if I were to guess, they're probably going to keep him in a cell all by himself. Maybe a whole cell block. I was in jails before with individuals with high profile cases and they would give them the whole 10 man block. So I wouldn't be surprised if they do something like that for this individual. But in 2014, Vandersloot's attorney says that his client has been stabbed three times in prison months after his initial transfer there for unruly behavior. Now the next story, I'm not going to go into high depth and detail on it. I already made a video dedicated solely to it. The six former Mississippi law enforcement officers, which went by the name of Goon Squad, were sentenced to decades in prison. I told y'all how much one of the individuals got sentenced to, well, all of them got sentenced now. After pleading guilty to a long list of state and federal charges for torturing and abusing two black men, Rankin County Circuit Judge Steve Ratcliffe gave the men state sentences that were shorter than the amount of time in federal prison that they had already received. But this is the amount of time that each officer got. Brett McAlphin got 20 years, 
Joshua Hartfield got 15 years. Christian Delman got 25 years. Hunter Edwards was sentenced to 45 years. Also, Jeffrey Middleton and Daniel Opdyke were sentenced to 20 years each. But keep in mind, all those sentences were shorter than what they got from the feds. But it goes on to say that the state sentences that came down Wednesday were ordered to run concurrently, which is what you do want to hear in the courtroom. If he said consecutive, then they all would have had to do all those 20, 40, 30 years in the federal prison system, get out, and then go to the state to do all their other 30, 40, 50 years. It would have been a life sentence. And in this situation, I definitely feel as though it should have been ran consecutive. Like I said, I'm not going to go into details again on this story, but what they did to these two individuals, let's just say if I were to see that whole scene played out in a movie, I'd say, man, this is a bunch of malarkey, man. It would never happen in real life, right? But it definitely did. And what makes it even scarier is that they were all law enforcement officers. And that just makes me wonder how many more are out there doing these type of despicable activities. But these guys, honestly, if they make it out of prison alive, I'd be completely surprised. I would have lost all my money on that bet. Now for the next story, I know there's legions of fans of this individual. But honestly, I ain't heard not one lick of his music. And probably never will because I can't stand country. Unless it's like some hillbilly music, you know, heel clicker stuff. The title of this article is Morgan Wallen could face six years in prison. But there's a very remote chance he will, says legal expert. Yeah, if I were to bet all my pesos on this one, this guy ain't even gonna get probation. But it says a criminal defense attorney, David Rabin, says he doesn't see Wallen going to jail for two years, but notes he may receive some sort of sentence to send a message. It says when Morgan Wallen allegedly threw a chair off the roof of Chief's Bar in Nashville on the night of April 7th, the chair landed on the ground near two police officers. Because of that, and because of the caliber of Wallen's country music fame, his situation becomes a bit more complicated than an average offender. Now why is that? What makes him so much more special than I? I don't care if he can sing a good old country tune or not. But Wallen, 30 years old, was arrested and charged with three counts of reckless endangerment, which are Class E felonies. Also a disorderly conduct, which is just a dusty misdemeanor. If I were to guess just by, you know, doing stories like this all the time, those felony charges are going to be dropped and you'll probably get found guilty, if anything, for the misdemeanor. Which, if it was me in his shoes, everything be flipped. Misdemeanor drop found guilty for the two felonies. You know, that's how it goes for the average folk. But the felony charges could carry one to two years in prison per count, as well as probation. Nashville-based criminal defense attorney and legal expert David Rabin says that while Wallen could technically face up to six years in prison because of the three counts, the chances of him being sentenced to the maximum and serving all those sentences consecutively are very remote. And I agree, I don't know anything about his past criminal background, but if he has nothing, then yeah, they're going to definitely give him a slap on the wrist. No maximum time whatsoever. Look at Morgan Wallen's mugshot. I can't help but to think, throw him a little cowboy hat and a ciggy, he'd be a perfect Marlboro man. But it says, still because the incident involved police officers, he may face a harsher sanction. That chair could have fallen on him and they could have been killed. Well, if if was a fifth, we'd all be drunk. But that's the bulk of this individual. I'll keep y'all updated with this case if he happens to see a little bit of the old D-block. But I'll bet my house on it. He ain't even gonna have to do no community service. Probably just throw a couple concerts for free for the officers. I'm just playing, man. I'm just playing. Y'all know I like to bring humor to a dark situation. And speaking of which, the next story is a dark one as well. Like I said, Brittany just alerted me on the phone and let me know this news. So this is gonna be the first time me reading it. The title of this article is O.J. Simpson, Dead at 76. The article starts by saying the football star was known more for his notorious murder trial than his exploits on the field. If the glove don't fit, you must have quit. Ain't that the truth, man. I remember that more than anything that he's ever done. Now, a statement from his family reads, On April 10th, Mr. Simpson succumbed to his battle with cancer. Oh, man. I had no idea he was even battling this. During this time of transition, the family asked that you please respect their wishes for privacy and grace. My condolences go out to his family, man. Very sad situation. But you know what? Time waits for no man, and everybody's ticket will be up sooner or later. It doesn't matter if you're good or bad, man, you know? The Reaper will be knocking at your door one of these days. 
Now, the next story is an update on that canine that was stabbed in the Virginia prison in Sussex. I just did a story on it the other day, and I told y'all it made me a little angry that they would send a dog in there to try to stop an attack on another inmate. I believe it was three inmates on one, stabbing them up. And they decide to send in old Rover instead of popping some flashbangs, some non-lethal rounds, and all the other stuff that they got. Rather put the animal into harm's way. Knowing damn well if they're stabbing people, they're definitely going to stab the dog. They don't care though, that's what he's designed for. Well, they shouldn't be anymore. A dog should be designed to pet and fetch. Maybe a few other things as well, catching frisbees and stuff like that. But never to work in a penitentiary. And PETA agrees. That's what we're speaking on today. They're chiming into this. After a five-year-old canine named Riven was violently stabbed and kicked to death while protecting a corrections officer who was trying to stop a fight involving inmates at Sussex One State Prison. PETA sent a letter out today to the Virginia Department of Corrections Director Chadwick Dotson urging the department to immediately stop using dogs in prisons to reallocate resources toward modern and superior population management techniques. Great wording, PETA. I love it. I understand them bringing in the canines during shakedowns with all the inmates separated from the pod or the housing unit. They bring in the dogs, let them sniff things out. But they should never be used to be sent in full force during a stabbing attack. But the article continues saying human officers knowingly accept the daily risks of their duties. But canines like Riven don't have any say in whether they're subjected to stressful or even life or death situations, says the senior vice president of PETA. PETA hopes that Riven's violent death serves as a wake-up call to the Virginia Department of Corrections and urges the agency to honor him by ending the use of canines in prison. I've got to hear y'all's input on this one. I know a lot of y'all are probably going to agree with PETA. I'm not going to lie, there's been times in the past where I thought it was just ridiculous some of the stuff that they were fighting against. But in this situation, I'm in complete agreement. Like I said, during the lockdown, shakedown or whatever, and they have the dogs come in to sniff the bunks away from the inmates. Yeah, that's fine with me, man. Keep letting them sniff whatever they want to sniff. But when you want to put them into a battle with inmates and shanks, that's a different ball game. If you're to ask me, you're sending that animal to death. And like Peter said, they don't have no choice in the issue. I don't know, very sensitive topic, but, uh, you know, I'm an animal lover to the core. I mean, I teach my kids all the time, don't hurt no bugs or anything unless you have to. Even if they're just annoying you, man, you know, try to make sure you shoo them off or get them out the house without killing them. And that's just insects. So just imagine how I look at dogs and everything else. But that's a wrap today for Channel 23 Lockdown News. Reporting pre-recorded from the Lockdown Compound. But stay tuned, as many of you already know, I got plenty more content coming your way. And it's funny too, because every time I say that, for the most part, a memory in the back of my head comes up and people in the comments section saying, how long can you possibly talk about lockup and prison content? It's a dead end route. I guess uh, uh, we're going on seven, eight years now. And we got an unlimited supply and gas in this prison car. It'll keep on rolling till the end of my time. And beyond. My kids might pick it up when I'm done. But I'm out of here, ladies and gentlemen. As always, until the next time. Y'all be easy, be safe, and more importantly than anything on earth, stay free.